Hello, and now uh, we're in our eighth week of going through the book of Acts. Uh, we're doing, now we're at a rate of about 10 verses uh, a week, although we're going to do 13 verses this week. I overview the verses on Sunday, and then on Monday through Friday, I go through the Greek of those verses. And then on Saturday, for those who are patrons of mine on patreon.com, uh, I give a little some, something special just for those who are patrons. Um, I can see from this week, we're going to get a lot into the New Testament use of the Old Testament. So we're going to get into Psalm 16 and Psalm 119 uh, and see how what those psalms probably meant in their original context and then see how the Holy Spirit inspired uh, Luke or Peter or both uh, to hear. Um, it, it gets complicated. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of those hermeneutical issues in the patrons only video on Saturday. Well, let's go over the verses for the week. So uh, Peter has just told the crowds uh, that they killed um, uh, somebody who was Jesus. They killed Jesus, somebody who had been attested by God um, as um, uh, somebody who, through whom God did miracles and, and uh, did wonders and signs uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that this was, uh, that um, the day of Pentecost uh, was a fulfillment, at least one fulfillment. Uh, there can be multiple fulfillments, I think, of Old Testament uh, scriptures. Uh, when you're when you're viewing them spiritually, uh, of Joel's prophecy uh, that the sun will be darkened, the moon turned to blood, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and so forth. And so he's he's just finished saying in verse 23 that the people of Jerusalem had killed uh, Jesus, even though he was God's man. Um, and and here's the verse continues: whom God raised, having loosed the birth pains of death, since it was not possible. For him to be held by it. Two interesting uh, things about this verse. First of all, there there is the sense that there is um, there is a power in Jesus that made it such that he could not be uh, contained by death. But uh, in keeping with the general practice of Luke and of the New Testament, God the Father is the one who is seen as the ancient, uh, the agent of uh, resurrection. So you know how we sing on Easter: He arose, He arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. The New Testament never puts it that way. The way the New Testament puts it is, God raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, very interesting. The agency of the Father, which, which plays into something I've said in my commentary throughout the, this past week, and that is, is that Acts seems to want us to see Jesus as playing it by the human rules um, to show us, and I would go further to say, that to make Jesus into a model, that there's nothing that Jesus did while he was on earth that we cannot also do uh, through the power uh, of the Holy Spirit, uh, that Jesus did not operate as, uh, he did not uh, enact the fullness of his divinity when he was on earth. He limited his knowledge. He limited his powers. He played it by the human rules. Even though he, uh, theologically we believe he remained omniscient. Theologically we believe he remained omnipotent. And yet somehow, in a mysterious way, he did not access his omniscience. He, he, did, he had partial, finite knowledge. Uh, he did not know everything that was going to happen um, uh, in terms of his conscious mind uh, when he was on earth as a human being. Well, I'm getting a little astray. Interesting expression here, having loosed the birth pains of death. Very interesting. Um, uh, 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 death could not hold him. Uh, uh, he was born to life. Um, interesting metaphor there. I haven't quite got my head around it. Uh, for David says about him, and now we, uh, uh, Peter slash Luke, uh, quote uh, Psalm 16. I was foreseeing the Lord continually before me because he is on my right hand in order that I might not be shaken. Of course, uh, this was originally true of, say, David, um, and then uh, uh, Peter slash Luke are going to take it of Jesus, but it is also scripture for us, I believe, uh, from Psalm uh, 116. Uh, you, as a Christian, uh, need not be shaken, because God is continually before you too, uh, and God is at your right hand too. Um, the psalmist continues, For this reason my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, and still my flesh will dwell in hope. And again, uh, true for the psalmist slash David, um, true for Jesus, uh, and it can be true for you too. Uh, your heart can be glad no matter your circumstance. Because you will not abandon my life in Hades, nor will you give your Holy One to see corruption. Um, 
Now, I believe in the original context, the psalmist slash David is saying, uh, you're going to rescue me from this situation. You're not going to let me be killed in this situation. But uh, Peter slash Luke um, see it in relation to um, Jesus uh, in that he's resurrected. But of course, it's true for us too, because uh, those who are in Christ have the promise of resurrection. We will not stay or be abandoned in the realm of the dead. And Hades, of course, is not Gehenna. Gehenna is the realm of punishment, of fire. Uh, Hades is, is, is a sense of the realm of the dead. It's a slightly metaphorical, I think. Um, God will not abandon us to corruption either. He will, he will let us uh, be resurrected uh, one day as well. But there's just multiple layers here. Uh, and I, I also think uh, that uh, Luke here is quoting the Septuagint. And so on Saturday, we'll get into this question of whether or not Peter would have preached in Greek or whether this is a kind of a paraphrase by, uh, by Luke uh, and so forth. It's complicated. Okay. Um, you have made known to me the ways of life. You have filled me with gladness uh, uh, with your face, with your presence. Uh, so there you have again, Psalm 16. Okay. Now we have the third paragraph of Peter's speech. Men, brothers, being permitted to say with boldness to you concerning the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is among us to this day. Uh, and so now um, uh, Luke slash Peter um, uh, is going to use some good Jewish exegesis here uh, and basically say that um, uh, if we take this not seeing corruption uh, in terms of uh, being held in the grave, uh, uh, then then it, it wouldn't apply to David uh, because David is still in the tomb. Um, th they knew where the tomb of David was uh, in the days, uh, or at least uh, according to tradition, in the days of, of Peter. And so uh, if you take uh, the Psalm 16 that way of staying in death, it was not true at that time of David. Therefore, so Peter's going to read now Psalm 16 in a spiritual census plenier in a fuller sense. Therefore, being a prophet and having known that God swore to him with an oath that someone from the fruit of his loins would sit on his throne, having seen ahead of time, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that neither was he abandoned into Hades, nor did his flesh uh, see corruption. This Jesus God raised, of whom we are witnesses. Uh, so again, if you, if you read it, uh, Psalm 16 in that way, uh, then Psalm 16 can be uh, seen spiritually uh, to refer to the resurrection of Christ. More on that on Saturday. Verse 32, again, God raised Jesus. Now, God is the agent, and of course, the very nature of an apostle. In, in, in the New Testament, the overwhelming uh, meaning of an apostle is someone who has witnessed the risen Christ and who has been sent as a witness of that uh, resurrection. Of course, here, specifically, the 12 are in mind, um, the 12 disciples who are now being sent as apostles to witness uh, to the resurrection of Christ, which they have all seen visibly uh, before them. And so finally, here, here's the rest of the speech. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received the promise from the Father of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this that you are seeing and hearing. So again, you see that, um, um, of course, John has a, um, a, a similar theology, um, that if, if Jesus does not ascend to heaven, then the Holy Spirit uh, will not be sent back. And so Jesus needs to go to heaven. So we're playing tag here. Uh, God the Father sends Jesus. Jesus goes up. He tags the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes back. Uh, anyway, this is, of course, the fulfillment of the promise. Um, John baptized you with water. I will baptize you with Holy Spirit. And uh, this is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and so the phen phenomenon that they're hearing, these men are not drunk, uh, but this is the fulfillment of Joel. Uh, this is because of the resurrection, and now the Holy Spirit uh, is in force on, on the earth. Verse 34, for David did not ascend to heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I should place uh, your enemies as a footstool for your, your feet. Um, and of course, Jesus uh, in Mark 12 also, um, Psalm, this is Psalm 110.1. It is incredibly important. Uh, in the New Testament. It's scattered throughout the whole New Testament, both directly and indirectly. Um, I wonder if this was the verse, uh, more than any verse, uh, that helped the early church uh, begin to understand what had taken place uh, in the resurrection. Um, and so uh, David is the my in this interpretation. 
So my Lord uh, is, the, is Jesus, the Messiah, and the Lord is God the Father. So to paraphrase uh, how, how Peter slash Luke is interpreting this verse, it's God the Father said to Jesus the Son, who is David's Lord, sit at my right hand. Um, and um, the book of Acts and Paul and Hebrews all understand this um, sitting at the right hand in relation to Jesus' exaltation after his resurrection. You can see in the context here, uh, he is exalted. Uh, this is, you know, sit at my right hand is the fulfillment of that. And then uh, verse 36, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made him, this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So Jesus' exaltation to God's right hand uh, and his sitting there, which is called his session, um, is uh, conceptualized here, I think, and I didn't come up with this, as a kind of enthronement. He is being enthroned as the Messiah. Now, of course, you know, we, we call him Messiah while he's on earth, but in a sense, he doesn't assume the throne. He doesn't assume the office. He doesn't um, get installed. He is the heir apparent up to this point. But now he is enthroned. He is installed. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. You see how that in the New Testament, uh, the, the lordship of Christ is most properly assumed after his resurrection and exaltation. See Psalm 2. Um, Therefore God has exalted him and given him a name above every name that every knee should bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so uh, most, most properly, the assumption of the roles of Lord and Christ and Son of God, as we'll see later in Acts 13, 33, take place in the theology of Acts at the enthronement after Jesus has died and risen and ascended and been exalted and seated at the right hand of God. And now he is Lord. He is enthroned in the heavens. He is the cosmic Lord of all. He is the true anointed one. He is the son of God. For to, And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Acts uh, 2 will come into play here. Um, uh, uh, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And again, when is that today? The New Testament understands that today to be the moment of his enthronement. Again, it's not that we can't speak of him as son of God or Lord of Christ before then, but there's a sense in which he hasn't really assumed the office. He haven't, hasn't really taken his seat on the throne. He hasn't really fully been enthroned until the deed is accomplished. And as Hebrews said, he has been perfected and has become uh, the, the, the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Well, okay, um, lots of meat there, I think. Uh, and th these are the verses for the week.